Okay, so welcome to this early session 5B. The main topic of this session is to give you an overview of the terrain art technical activities, what's going on in the different projects, uh, what will go on very early with new projects which are starting. Uh, I apologize for the small delay, but you all know it has been a sudden change because of an air flight being delayed many hours with speakers of the plenary session. So they are landing now. We hope they land now. Our first speaker will talk about uh, one of the projects which has been done in Torreina, but he's also the leader of the new project which is going to start, which is, well, it, nearly new project. It has been proposed many times ago, but now officially started finally. It went through the paperwork after a long delay this winter, and the project is uh, scampy. But he has also been working on uh, tequila and many other activities. So I would simply very quickly introduce Stephen van den Berge and try to get up with the delay. Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, getting me to talk at 9 o'clock in the morning is already hard enough. Getting me to give a presentation at 9 o'clock in the morning is going to be even harder. But I'll do my best to make it a little bit fluent. Um, as we said, um, Tequila is a project which started two years, four months and a half ago, and which is lasting two years and a half, meaning two years, five months and a half, and which lasting two years and a half, meaning it's being finished in a few uh, weeks. Um, Tequila is a project on traffic engineering for quality of service in the internet at large scale, meaning Tequila built an uh, automatic provisioning system for IP, MPLS, DivServe based networks. Tequila looked at ways to interact with users in terms of getting uh, service level specifications from the users to the uh, provisioning system. And Tequila has just given a successful demo at their hopefully very last audit and hopefully very successful audit um, last month in Maastricht. Now, a lot of things happened within Tequila. Uh, one of them is, is a lot of work being done in the ITF. Uh, I'm going to focus on, on one piece of Tequila where I've been mainly working on, and that's the relationship between uh, traffic engineering and monitoring, or generally speaking, cost provisioning and monitoring. Uh, we did some work there, ended up in writing an internet draft, which in his turn ended up being merged with a lot of other drafts, which in his turn became the traffic engineering working group document uh, for the relationship between measurements and traffic engineering, where I'm one of the co-authors of. So I'm going to start with tequila, move to measurements, talk about a few things which I think need to be done. So I'm going to take off my tequila hat and just wear my own personal hat. And from that, looking at the role of measurements in this kind of systems, from that, look at what we're going to do in Scampi, which is a new project, which luckily finally started in April after a lot, a lot of paperwork, well, or a lot of uh, delays inside the paperwork. And look, this project started in April, it's lasting for another two and a half years, and look what we can do in there and why it's so useful. This is the tequila model we once dreamed up in a very late night meeting. Looks fairly complex is if you look at it like this, so I'm going to simplify a little bit. Actually, tequila is built of, of four major blocks. You've got uh, everything which is happening close to the wire, which is the things you have to configure, the data plane, and the monitoring around it, where I'm going to focus on in this presentation. You've got a whole traffic engineering system, a system that does the calculation of where paths have to go in your network and how traffic is divided over those paths. Now, that needs some information. This information is coming from an SLS management system. What is this SLS management system? This is sitting close to the user and is translating the SLSs as they come in into a certain demand to the network. And it's actually on this aggregate demand that we're going to do our traffic engineering on. This traffic engineering is going to give, is going to calculate some available resources in the network, the things he has actually established in the network, and going to give that back to SLS management so he can decide who can come in and who cannot come in. Because Tequila has uh, taken the option of, of a two-level approach. 
Instead of just having a user coming in saying, I want something right now, and give, here is the SLS, and we, please provision this for me, Tequila is using two epochs. It's using a subscription epoch. So you first subscribe to a service with a certain SLS. From the subscription, a traffic demand is derived. Something is provisioned. And then you have to invoke a service. So you have to say, well, now I want to use it. And by that time, the resources are, are already provisioned. And there's a, of course, we're not going to, it's a little bit more complicated like that than that. We're going to do some multiplexing in that traffic engineering so we can allow some more services because not everybody is using all his services at the same time. This is an automated provisioning process, which is, um, on one hand, very fun. You don't have to do anything on the command line anymore. On the other hand, might be a, a very painful thing if you don't have any control of what is happening inside that provisioning, inside those algorithms. That's why there's a policy management system on top of it which allows you to tune some of the parameters inside each of the tequila blocks, inside the block which is doing the multiplexing, which is determining how much more you're going to allocate than you need, and things like that. Another problem with this type of uh, architecture, and that's the problem where I mainly want to talk about, so you've got resource provisioning, taking a certain demand forecast, taking the SLS, SLS subscriptions, Configuring the network, a div serve, I'm going to focus on a div serve MPLS network. Um, configuring the admission control, as I said, giving information back to the SLS management. Having, if you have a set of LSPs, you're going to want to do load balancing. So you've got the LSPs which are being created, but they're worth nothing as long as you don't, do not decide which traffic you're going to put on which path. Because there's actually two important components on all this MPLS traffic engineering. Most people are focusing on how to design these nice pods in the network going from one source to one destination. But which is equally important is how to put traffic on it, the form of tunnel management, which is often forgotten. Now, if you are in a multi-vendor situation, if you are in a real network, turning on a queue means changing the behavior of your router. Setting up an extra LSP is meaning extra, having an extra header is changing the behavior of the router. Having a multi-vendor network, every router is going to behave in a different way. Now, if you want to build a kind of bandwidth brokering in general system on top of that, and you want to take everything into account which is happening on there, you're going to need an analytical model which is uh, almost as big as an encyclopedia if you want to take all those things into account. So you need some kind of feedback, an operational use of monitoring, to be able to fine-tune the way your system is behaving. And this is the role of monitoring where I want to talk about. It's not, if, if you hear people talking about monitoring in, in a cost provisioning area, it's all about SLS auditing. It's all about seeing whether I'm giving the service that I want to be seeing. Is having nice graphs to show up to management and things like that. It's often not about using the monitoring in an operational way. It's not about taking monitoring and fine-tuning your model with that. So there's actually two distinct ways of using monitoring in these systems. And in Tequila, we have, have looked at these feedback loops and have implemented hooks on each system to be able to take monitoring information and use it in an automatic way, an operational way, as uh, opposed to a diagnostic way. And this is also something which, uh, which ended up in that first internet draft we written for the uh, Traffic Engineering Working Group. So, what are the requirements of such a feedback mechanism? We're running in a nice, which I call a multi-path, multi-class networking environment, meaning if you want to do measurements, you have to be careful if you do an end-to-end -end measurement. If you have multiple paths, then you have multiple characteristics from one and to the other, which is quite logical. You have a, a large set of, of possible metrics for all of your services. They can be one-way, round-trip, loss, delay, offered load. We've seen these uh, being proposed often enough. Very important in this type of architecture, we want to do more than just pulling things. We, just, we want to do more than just having a characteristic every hour. We want to have uh, unsolicited report triggering too. What do I mean with that? I want to have a trigger if my delay is bigger than two milliseconds because I want to act on that. On that. I want to change the way I traf uh, map traffic to LSPs and things like that. So that's a very different use of monitoring and something where a lot of the... Uh, the tools we need for that are just starting to emerge. So we need a measurement architecture. 
this is more or less well, what, I, what I already said. We've got different places to, to um, monitor. We've got different things to monitor. There's a very generic picture. If I want to do it customer to customer, the ripe kind of boxes are doing a very good job of that. Uh, the one-way delay protocol is using encryption and things like that. So you've got a trust issue there. You want to make sure that, that nobody is touching your uh, packets, which is something completely different as what we are re requiring. So we don't really need the whole one-way active measurement protocol possibilities. We don't need encryption and things like that. We are happy enough to be able to measure within our own network where we're, well, at least mostly trusting ourselves. Now, there's a few other issues. You've got uh, the thing I already mentioned. You've got the multipart issue. You've got the scalability issue if I can want to measure everything. It's, of course, not possible or not at least everything for everybody. And in the core, we need extra functions, which are not always there. So we, we need some more complexi complexity there in our measurements function, especially for the uh, unsolicited reporting, for getting these, these triggers automatically from our network. Tequila has built a wonderful measurement architecture, which is able to combine active measurements, passive measurements, hop-by-hop -hop measurements, end-to-end -end measurements, both in a configuration way, so we, can, we have one architecture where we can say, well, I want this passive measurement and this active measurement, and we don't do it the IETF way like it is now. You have to go to this working group for having a measurement for that technology, go to the ARMO working group for having another measurement, go to the IPPM working group for having an active measurement. So we've got one interface where we can measure, where we can configure any measurement, which is, I think, very important because the, the large scale of metrics we're going to need in, in traffic engineering. It's just too large to, to have different interfaces for every type of measurements you, you want to do. The network monitor is something we invented to be able to correlate things. For instance, for scalability issues, we're not want to do an end-to-end -end measurement for every uh, pair of, of, of nodes we've got in our network. So what we're doing is just doing hop-by-hop -hop measurements and concatenating them. Now, uh, it's not ideal. But it's good enough for most of our purposes because often the things which are happening inside the node are fairly constant. So if, if we do a hop-by-hop -hop aggregation and just want to react to it if things get worse, this is giving us a very good estimation. And then for selected SLSs, we do it as a service, as an extra service to do SLS monitoring. So actually this is just this diagnostic monitoring. It's just an extra service. It's the bottom two, the node monitoring and the network monitoring where all the intelligence is. Um, this is the typical um, picture you see if somebody from Tequila is talking about SLS. This is how SLSs are correlated to, uh, to the DevServe um, elements, why they are an extra value. You've got the same thing with monitoring. You have monitoring at different levels. You've got them in the router. You've got, you want to aggregate some things over a path. You want to do uh, monitoring end-to-end -end and things like that. Down at the wire, um, Actually, we're one of the first to think about um, a DivSurf and PLS model. You've got DivSurf fairly worked out in, in many places. The combination DivSurf and PLS is uh, standardized in the sense that we know how it works, but there is no real management information base or anything or policy information base for something like that. So that's fairly new. And the routers look something like this. Well, this is a picture I use for my Linux routers where I'm uh, working on the MPLS part. Now, if we look at monitoring, this is all the things we can monitor on them. This is where the counters are placed in, together with active monitoring, of course. So you have to make a selection there, because you're not going to do everything. So that's Tequila. It's a two-level traffic engineering, where we have a combination of DivSurf management, tunnel management, and a uniform measurement management. And where, actually, if you look at standards, this is the only thing which is clearly defined, is the DivSurf provisioning. All the rest is, is somewhere in the air right now. I'm going to take off the tequila hat now and generalize this a little bit more because actually this is something we need in a lot of load balancing systems. If I went to the next room and talk about, about load balancing on grid systems, you've got measurements, you've got a selection of peers, you've got the same in peer-to-peer -peer networks, you've got the same in content distribution networks. This type of architecture giving an uh, unsolicited reporting based on measurements is very useful. Uh, you've got, I've, I've been doing nice things like, for instance, if you're in the middle of your network and you want to do 
a measurement. Uh, it's not always useful to always send a report, so you can do some evaluations close to the wire, which is also important because I don't want to send every signal back to my, um, to my uh, management system. So I, for instance, might send a signal if, uh, compared to the load, if my load goes uh, up, then the probability of having a remapping becomes bigger. So I send a, a signal back if this, with, with this formula. Um, so this gives you this, this um, abstract architecture where you have active measurements, uh, where, which I call synthetic source, synthetic reporter combinations, because I don't really like to invent a new signaling protocol to set up, uh, to set up active measurements. So I'm, I'm using a um, more modular way, which complies, which is closer to the way you install the passive measurements. You've got something reporting passive measurements. Well, I'm just reporting whatever I get from my active sessions, and I've got something that sends active sessions. This is actually somewhat stolen from the Armon working group. And then you've got evalu uh, evaluators on top of it, or you can still do with the same architecture, you can still do the diagnostic reporting. So you've got one architecture where you're either evaluating things or you're giving regular updates with a certain timeout. Um, this is just a way I proposed personally, not within Tequila, to, to extend RSPT for doing that, but we're not going to look at that. Uh, one thing we noticed, if we look at active versus passive measurements, is that active measurements, like the ripe box, often aren't very adequate for this job for another reason, next to the fact that they're, they're actually aimed at inter-domain measurements and then things you cannot trust. It's good for delay, it's terrible for loss, because you need a fairly large amount of, of uh, probes to be able to get an accurate loss count. If, you lose, if you're sending two packets a second, you're looking every second and you're losing one of them, your measurement system, your active measurement system is going to say you get 50% loss. But it just might be that this, this one packet is being lost. So that's why, for most things, I prefer to use passive measurements. It's only actually for the delay, which is now also being more or less solved by, by taking traces out of the routers, timestamping traces and comparing them offline which is another way of doing delay measurements. So mostly, you're better off with passive measurements. Uh, what's next tunnel management? Uh, this is actually a slide which I should delete because there used to be an ITF effort in trying to set up something which does the tunnel management. Next to the fact of traffic engineering and MPLS being able to set up tunnels, there used to be a few people uh, amongst myself trying to start something off with um, with, how to, with defining how to map traffic and f uh, defining ways to map traffic to LSPs. Unfortunately, that started off somewhere beginning of September, and that uh, due to people being having too much work to do, this, this, uh, these drafts are actually about to expire, which is a pity, because I think this is very useful. Because it's wider than just MPLS, it's wider than just LSPs. You can use it for IPsec, you can use it for peer-to-peer, -peer, you can use it for grid. This type of, of application, the use of, of, of uh, advanced tunnels and advanced measurements. Again, we need uniform uh, measurement management. Another thing which is important, we don't need it for TE only. There are people asking us to do denial of service attack measurements. Who, those of, who, of you who were in the, uh, the measurement section yesterday saw it that people want to do this. They want to look at strange things happening on their network. You want still to do uh, network diagnostics for planning reasons, things like that for accounting. So there are a lot of people needing measurements, and now they have all have to have their own interface. So that's a problem. You need to have resource control. If we have multiple people requesting things from the measurement system, we need to know who asked what, if he can have it, uh, how much he can take of these measurement resources. So we need to do some resource control. And when we go to high-speed wires, we need to do it close to the wire and try to evaluate things as close to the wire as possible. Otherwise, you need an extra network for sending your measurement information up. Also, for security reasons, measurements are very important. I heard somebody from uh, Tickets Telecom Italia saying, uh, well, we'll be happy if we can just know where all the uh, new sports are being used for so we can shut down all the Napsters running on our network or at least narrow their bandwidth a little bit. So this, this is another reason why this is useful. You've seen I've put the Scampi on top of there. Uh, Scampi only started in April, but this is actually what the goal of Scampi is. Scampi is trying to find a way to do high-speed monitoring 
to have a uniform interface to monitoring and to be able to do resource control amongst different people needing monitoring. And this is a project we started in April, and uh, so I'm, I'm not able to say much more about it because we're still thinking much more about it. But um, if you're interested in, in this type of things, there is definitely something to watch. And the web page is on there. If you go there, you see only welcome to scampi.org. Um, and Kevin promised me that he'd make work of this in the next few weeks once he relaxed from this experience. So. Thank you, Stephen. Is there any question? Everything so clear? Once David. Um, Not this early in the morning. You can do that. Okay. Thanks. Um, who's going to use it? Uh, Scampi or tequila? <laughs> uh, tequila. <laughs> tequila. Well, um, tequila is going to be used for everybody who needs dynamic provisioning of quality of service in this network and um, who's tired of running scripts and designing scripts um, or doesn't see a way of, of doing the, the provisioning as they're doing it right now with, with modifying some scripts and configuring things. And this. This doesn't only apply to the big core networks. Could be as well an access network. No, I, I understand that, but I was sort of, how are you going about diffusing it out of the project? Exactly. Uh, well, we've got some uh, partners like uh, Alcatel, France Telecom. Uh, especially Alcatel is just looking at the in the, in the in the short time scale because they. I've, I've talked about this invocation. If mm -hmm. you put a SIP gateway there, and like they're fond of, of telephony. And then you got an invocation because you got somebody picking up a phone and that's an invocation of a service. So that might, might be a way for, for taking this information at uh, the short time scale. Also, France Telecom, although they're more focusing on the, um, the IP components in there, so we've got a, a, similar, a similar architecture is also built on top of uh, DSCP routing and, um, and um, the plain IP, no MPLS in it, just DSP routing and, and DivServ. And they're looking at it uh, then more for the SLS part, for instance, for the VPN deployment. So there's actually people using this at, in a very short time scale. Uh, may I interpret also David's question in a more provocative way? <laughs> you are mentioning all the big carriers anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of, of national network or simply users community which have this, exactly the same kind of need. Yeah, and, and which are actually using it. Market the solution to them because very often they don't know when they yeah. try to reinvent it from scratch. Well, actually, there's one thing which is very good market, marketed in this thing, and that's the SLS specification, yeah. which is, uh, I think, Sequin is, is, is working on, on that and are using actually the same SLS between the NRNs. So do you get the scope? You've got this nice description. About this marketing, we need to do a lot of more marketing. We have been working way too hard in the last two and a half years. So we're going to spend some time on marketing as soon as possible. But this is, of course, um, and I know within the NRN community, there's, there's definitely, um, well, I wouldn't call it market. There are definitely interests in, in deploying something like this, being able to do a deserve deployment, because in the end, it's, it's, an, it's a bandwidth brokering-like application, but with a little bit more possibilities, doing more than just bandwidth brokering. It's, it's also configuring your networks, seeing more than just here's the bandwidth and put it in pieces yeah. and give it to people. It's configuring your network. So, but uh, since NRNs are still, well, we've, we've got the first DivServ deployments now. Uh, putting something on top of it is, I think, a next phase, which is uh, yeah. cool. OK, we, I mean, there may be other questions, but you know, we should probably think of, you should think of going out to interest the people in that network management market, I mean, the HPs and, and mm. others of this world. Is there any other question? If not, we thank Stephen. <laughs> Next speaker is Egon. Egon, I believe, is very well known to our community, at least you've seen in on some screens at some time because his specialty is video conferencing and he is the innovation manager at Surfnet taking care of 
streaming and video conferencing. Uh, he has been the leader of TF Stream, which is just closing down at, at this uh, conference, but uh, I know he's going to tell us that there is something after TF Stream. Igor. Exactly. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, this is a presentation in two parts. First, a report on what TF Stream has been doing. And that's a bit strange since um, TF Stream officially ended a year ago. So some of the work I'm presenting is about a year and a half or two years old, which is a lifetime in internet time. So uh, a lot of things have, ha have happened. But this is the first time that we can officially present this at the Terena conference, although uh, we, we ended officially a year ago. The report I will be talking about and the deliverables is available. It's on the table here, so if you would like to take a copy, you're welcome to it. It's also available in PDF format on the website of TF Stream. The other presentation of the talk is where we're going. And, well, let me uh, tell you the conclusion of the presentation today. We feel that TF Stream was very successful. And one way of measuring that is seeing the still growing interest in what we've been doing and the need to follow up with some other um, task forces and working groups. Uh, I also will show a little about what is going on in um, uh, especially the United States or other working groups that focus on video conferencing and video streaming. TF Stream started out by organizing a virtual feather session at the Terena Networking Conference in 1999 in, in Lund. And there were a little over 30 people, almost 40 people from, I believe, 16 or 17 different uh, national research networks that said, well, it's very interesting and uh, video has now been seen as a new killer application for our high-speed networks. Let's do something about that. So we organized a meeting by the end of December, over in December 1999. And um, in the meantime, we worked on uh, the discussion on what the goals should be, writing a charter, and proposing that to the TTC. The official start of uh, uh, TF Stream was on, on January in 2000. And we got a one-year mandate that was later extended for half a year. The name focused on um, streaming. That, it, it looks a lot like streaming. And that's the first part that we wanted to tackle. But setting this up, and we already gave it a name, it turned out that there was as much interest in video conferencing as there was in streaming. So the official name is the Task Force on Real-Time Multimedia Applications. Well, we still call it TF Stream because that has a nicer ring to it. The objectives were to, uh, of course, share uh, experience, uh, do some experiments, learn from that, and also provide information to people who want to pick up and start uh, these, uh, these new uh, projects in their research network, university, or community. Uh, these five, and uh, from, from these five objectives, uh, we feel that, uh, especially the first one, uh, the second one, uh, the third one, have been uh, very successful, and I will tell about a little bit about that later. Uh, the fourth and fifth one uh, were not so successful. Uh, there have been some, some pilots, but not to the extent that we would like it to have. This was also the reason to specifically focus on these last two ones to continue the work. Just to go briefly over the several deliverables that we've uh, defined in uh, the first year in the extension uh, until the summer, and then where we've been working on uh, since that, and to go briefly over this. The first deliverable was to set up an information site uh, where people could find uh, all what we were doing. And this seems like a trivial matter. Well, just set up a website and tell what your website is doing. But it's very important that this gets, uh, uh, is, is updated on a regular basis. After the meetings, immediately the results, and not only uh, the me meeting notes, but also all appropriate links to the different technologies that we've been discussing uh, will be up on the website. 
and uh, Valentino and Terena did a, did a good job in, um, in keeping this up to date. The second one was a glossary of terms. And especially two years ago, when we, well, almost two and a half years ago when we discussed this, it turned out that everyone was using different terms for the same or the same terms for different things. So we spent some time scoping and discussing on what terms to use and finally said, well, we should just all write it down and use this standard vocabulary uh, when we're talking about streaming and video conferencing. And by the way, video conferencing and video streaming are two different things. Don't mix them, please. Uh, especially <laughs> when, when talking uh, about this. Video conferencing is very interactive. Video streaming is usually one way from one to one and one to group. Um, and that's very different. You need different techniques, although some network issues and video codecs and audio codecs are the same. They are two different applications, need different organizations and techniques. The third one was, well, practice what you preach. And uh, since this was about video conferencing and how you can use video conferencing on a larger scale than just one-to-one, -one, we want to set up some European video conferences. This was also a follow-up uh, to the mega conference. In the fall of 1999, uh, the first mega conference was organized, which was the largest single H3-3 video conference in the world. Um, until that day, H3-3 video conferencing wasn't used that extensively over the internet and as a service. And from the day on, that use grew. And we also wanted to do that, so we organized several European video conferences in which we had a number of servers connected to each other and allowing uh, uh, researchers and people from uh, the National Research Network using whatever H3 to 3 client they have to come together in one conference. We've had uh, organized four, and the first one was just as a showcase, and the three afterwards we actually used to conduct uh, meetings uh, of TF Stream. And the number of participants were usually 15 or 16 from 9 to 10 different European countries that used the system of four different MCUs. I must say, this conference, we've heard a lot about video conferencing and most focused on multicast video conferencing tools. In TF Stream, we've mainly focused on H3 to 3 video conferencing tools. And not because we don't like multicast video conferencing tools, but because multicast video conferencing tools now have been used by user communities. And there have not been set up, and it's very hard to set up, national services. 3 to 3 is uh, equipment that you can just buy from the vendors, get support, and is used to really set up national services. Like, for instance, Ukraine announced uh, yesterday that they will now have a national service. And other European countries have that. What is, of course, important is to make it possible that people using different technologies will be able to communicate, communicate with each other. And that's also what we've been uh, looking into, but not so much in these European video conferencing, but especially of late, where we use, for instance, the VRVS schedule uh, to, uh, to schedule uh, some conferences, then have people using the old M-Bone tools uh, to do multicast video conferencing and cascading the reflectors to our set of MCUs with which all the H3 to 3 clients can connect. But at least this was, in, in that sense, very successful that this led to uh, a set, the setting up of uh, video conferencing services in national research networks and the ability to combine them very easily, connect them very easily. On the streaming part, we also wanted to make sure that whenever someone was streaming that the whole of Europe could see that. Now, one way, again, is uh, using multicast, but as we've uh, heard before, and especially uh, uh, some organizations, research networks and groups said, well, unfortunately, our network is not multicast enabled, or too many of our universities aren't multicast enabled. We still want to set up an infrastructure to make it possible that people could uh, follow streams. Well, so we 
set ourselves the goal to uh, set up a network infrastructure for distributing live streaming events across Europe. And you see a little X before it, which means that this has not been totally successful. <coughs> Sorry. Our goal was to set up a fixed network and make it possible that you could announce an event and it would stream in whatever format across these servers distributed across Europe and everyone could just uh, look at it in, uh, in unicast streams and their favorite format. Well, that was far too ambitious. Um, <clears throat> what we did do is look at the different technologies, like for instance, Real and Windows Media and QuickTime. And again, remember this was a year and a half ago. Um, unfortunately, uh, every one of us, uh, and that means all the participants in TF Stream from the different research networks had real servers. Uh, you could set up an, an infrastructure with real, which spread the streams and have servers sending streams to other servers, which distribute them locally. However, you need different licenses for that, and nobody had the proper licenses. So we only did some small experiments together with Belnet and reported on that. The larger experiment, and that's the, the mark where it says, well, we did have some success, is that we did set up the efficient distribution network during the last TNC. With the kind help of network appliance, uh, we moved several stream splitting boxes across Europe and had one signal coming out of uh, the trainer conference in Turkey, send that to London where it was split to five different stream, uh, splitting boxes uh, across Europe where several hundreds and thousands of people could watch. Uh, unfortunately, because of well, the, the, the network itself and stream splitting worked perfectly. While it wasn't a total success because the uh, satellite link from Turkey to England was saturated and suffered uh, from uh, quality loss of the signal. Um, but we showed at least that it was possible with a little means to set up such an infrastructure and we did describe the cookbooks for everyone that want to repeat such a thing. Another um, deliverable we defined was uh, by organizing TF Stream, we want to make sure that more and more content that was available in the archives or that the different research networks knew about would become available to the rest of the group. And we also want to describe a policy document for publishing audio video material in the public domain. This has been proved very difficult. And the reasons for that were several, and uh, I, I can mention five of them which prevented setting uh, things up. One is language barrier in Europe. It turned out that, for instance, Finland had wonderful video archives, but that 90% of it, well, maybe it was fun to watch, but nobody understood what it was about. Now, of course, you ju just can't change that. And then we said, well, should we have everything in English? But then it's forcing different research networks to produce video material for their community first and then spreading it across Europe to force to do that, for instance, in English, uh, which for some countries was just not an option. The second problem was format. Um, there are many different video streaming formats and services. If you want to set up something, you have to recommend one. And that's very difficult, too, because people just have their favorites. They say, no, nope, we want to do everything for free, so we're using Windows Media. And others say, well, Windows Media, especially a year and a half ago, that's not high quality enough. I want to do it in MPEG, too. That's fine, but try finding a user community that has thousands of MPEG-2 decoders that can play the stream. That is impossible. Hopefully, we get there. But as soon as we set a standard and say, well, this is good, then there's a new codec and new standard that's even better. So that has to be kept updated, but we couldn't decide on one. Um, third problem was network connectivity. Although you can describe these video uh, services and archives and how to produce content, if you then start announcing it and making it available, you have to make sure that everyone that is willing to see it can actually get it and be able to see it. And especially if you distribute this across Europe, 
you need that network infrastructure of stream splitting and stream distribution to guarantee that everyone gets a good quality stream. And since we didn't have that, we couldn't conclude on this, except saying that, yes, you need something uh, like that to make it work. The biggest problem, however, was, and we heard that already uh, from the first plenary, uh, copyright issues. And making sure that there was some protection against misuse. We all learn, uh, live in an academic environment and we all know that students are ripping uh, CDs and video films and distributing that and whatever they do with it, that's fine as long as we don't know. But in this case, if we start producing our own content and making sure that everyone can access it, that's fine, that's our goal. But if people start um, using the material in a way that it is not meant to be used or even distort the material, and which that's, that's really what, uh, what this is about. Not that people use it, copy it, and spread it in a different way than it was meant to be. I mean, that is something that at least I can live with. Uh, but if people start editing the material because they can get to the source uh, uh, of, of the material and then do things with it that the producer and the people paying the producer to, to make this uh, did not mean, then the whole meaning of the, of the source and the meaning of the stream can change. And you have to protect that for some way. Also, uh, when we start talking about publishers to make available audio, video material, then this is, of course, even more strict than the ones that we produce ourselves. So you have to think about the licensing model. When we looked at this, uh, the European legislation wasn't the, the one that was now. Um, so we had to deal with about nine or ten different uh, laws that described how to handle copyright in different countries. We deemed this too, uh, uh, too difficult to, to continue. But we did describe all these issues, what you can do, and several licensing models that you can use to publish audio video material in the public domain. Well, all these are the things that I was talking about. Um, as part of the uh, Train a Portal project, uh, there also was a page maintained by Juri Demchenko that described uh, publicly available audio video material on the different uh, pilots with high quality streaming especially that were going on and we made it part of this. When setting up large archives it's very important that people are able to search the archives, describe them in a proper way and, um, and make them available. So it was very important that when using, uh, when talking about streaming media and video archives that we looked into metadata and especially the work by Carnet uh, on a metadata model to, uh, to describe such video archives uh, that has been, has been published and made part of, uh, of the deliverables and is now the recommendation on how to go about. Let me say that um, we believe that in describing video collections and video assets, qualified Dublin Core and Dublin Core, which comes from the library standard, is still a very good standard. Everyone is talking about MPEG-7 and we like MPEG-7, you can do wonderful stuff with it, but we feel that it's more appropriate to describe the attributes of a video, the attributes of an asset, than describing descriptive views and, dis and, and, and descriptions of the asset and the collections itself. So we see a combination of searching through archives on uh, collections and assets uh, described in Qualified Dublin Core, looking inside the as asset using MPEG-7. Um, of course, is uh, uh, while doing all these experiments, we learned a lot ourselves. And we've been writing down and making checklists that ev everyone that wants to set up a live video conference or stream a live event, where, what you sh should, should you think about? What should you double check? And these checklists are available. Um, of course, when looking at uh, efficient distribution of video streams, uh, we did look at multicast uh, issues and also said, well, if something goes wrong and the quality isn't uh, uh, as expected at the end user, um, what has gone wrong? How can we see if it's about the multicast uh, signal? So we looked at different multicast monitoring tools 
and um, Funet uh, actually made a page that described all these different tools. Uh, why the X? Well, the goal was to set up a clearinghouse. Everyone that had a tool or a newer tool or wrote a new tool could send it in. We would evaluate it and announce and describe and publish it. That part hasn't, uh, hasn't come through. One of the last one was the DiffSurf experiment. And the DiffSurf experiment, um, unfortunately, couldn't go through as planned because just when we were trying to do the experiment, the first, um, sorry, let me say, uh, yeah, there was some problems with uh, delivering the lines for the Géant and, and uh, the, the networks that were used for this experiment. Uh, the architecture has been set up. Luckily, also the people setting up uh, the Sequan project uh, defined some new experiments where they specifically look at H3-3 uh, uh, traffic, for instance, so audio and video traffic over the new networks and do the measurements and monitoring and diff serve experiments on that. Uh, that has not been done while we were writing this report, but as soon as they're done, they will be published on the Sequan website. We also thought that we could look in security, how to secure video streams. Uh, but time was just too short to do any real work on that. And, um, well, like we've heard before, if you look into that, you have to look at all the different aspects. So also securing your multicast stream, well, secure multicast, that is just uh, too hard to solve by the streaming people. Even the network people can't solve it at the moment. Of course, we organized a workshop, and especially the one that was uh, done as one of the last activities in TFStream was the workshop on high-quality streaming and video conferencing. Um, while some groups were starting up building video conferencing services, other groups had very high demands, especially, for instance, from the medical community, to use a lot higher quality than what either the multicast conferencing tools or what H3 3 can provide. They... Also, some of them were used, like the Scottish uh, uh, Video Conferencing Network, to MJPEG over ATM. And now everything was going IP, so let's do MJPEG over IP, which is not trivial, and there aren't any, uh, many tools that can do that. So we organized a workshop to see um, actually where we could go, what was the common interest, uh, what experience people had with the different tools, uh, and that was a very successful workshop, and we hope to organize a follow-up. And the last one was the feasibility study of a European video conferencing service. In the lifetime of TF3, more and more research networks, like I said, were setting up their own services. And uh, we thought that maybe we could set up a European service on top of that, and we would do a feasibility study. Well, the X marks that it didn't happen, but... The tick mark that says it still was a success was there is now a, a, a gatekeeper hierarchy in which the different H3-3 video conferencing services of the different research networks, but also institutes, universities can take part, which is connected to FIDENET, which is the largest H3-3 video conferencing network in the world, and you can use simple alias-based dialing to reach any of the NRNs. So part of what we were planning to do in the future in setting up a European video conferencing service actually is in operation right now. Um, and the efforts did come from the TF stream. That concluded the part of what we've been doing. If you want to read the details, read the re uh, report, and please look at the website. Now what we're going, what we've learned, and what to do. The first one is that we said, well, we haven't concluded anything on video conferencing or we haven't stopped and developments are going on. We need to do that. And one of the things that we haven't looked at is combining voice with video conferencing. So do voice over IP or IP telephony. So there was a poll in the second half of 2001 uh, amongst the Terena members. Is this something that is interesting to you and do you think that Terena has to work on it? And there was substantial interest. More than half of all the research networks says, yes, this is important. Please look at it. So we organized a workshop uh, in March 
where again more than 30 people from 15, 16 different countries showed up that said, this is interesting and maybe we want to work on that. We also organized the, uh, the, the working group meeting on Sunday. Um, the main topics we're talking about, of course, again, is sharing experience. For instance, Chestnet in Czechia has the, the largest voice over IP network here in Europe uh, uh, amongst the higher education and research network. So we can learn a lot from them. Uh, they want to combine their test bed, of course, with test beds in other countries that are set up, uh, if not only to do toll bypass, but especially look at the new services that make doing uh, combining voice over IP and video over IP. Uh, write a cookbook. What if organizations want to set up their own voice over IP network? What should they do? What should they buy? What should they look at? How to combine it with the rest of the stuff? And of course, in combining, looking at international dialing schemes. Um, we did have two volunteers uh, that would oversee the coordination, but actually at the moment we're in this painstaking process of defining all the goals and finding out who wants to do what and when. Um, the goal still is to make this a new Terrena task force. The second one, which is, uh, especially on the organization part, a lot further, is the Academic Netcasting Working Group. And as the title shows, we're focused on netcasting, and especially those issues in streaming that have been uh, left out or not concluded in TF Stream. Looking at ways to produce high-quality content for the higher education and research community in Europe, and making sure that there's a uniform way in which to stream that content out to our community and consist uh, uh, constituency and uh, help them in, in receiving that in a, in a good quality. That is in a nutshell uh, what we're about. We organized uh, above at the Nordinet conference. Uh, this was all discussed on the TF Stream mailing list and, and invitations were sent out. Uh, we also organized another working group meeting on uh, last Sunday. Uh, Dan Munster from UNIC uh, is, is uh, doing the coordination right now, and we plan to form a task force real soon. We've had a discussion about the goals and the deliverables, so we, uh, we're in the stage of writing the charter and uh, proposing a new task force. The goals that we set for now are short, the annou uh, an announcement portal. And portal is between code quotes because, of course, that's one of the old hype words that died out. But what we mean with that is that there's a uniform way to describe an event that you are streaming in your own organization and that you want uh, the rest of the Europe and the rest of the world to know that it is uh, being streamed, uh, in what format, what clients you need, download the clients. So looking at that, how to come up with a uniform way to announce it. By the way, I have to point forward that this is not something that we're doing on our own. Uh, Ted Hans from Internet2, director of Internet2 applications, will describe some of exactly this happening in Internet2. Then that goal of produce and help to produce high quality content about research topic of interest to our community making sure that in the end we can set up this live streaming channel and if you know something about research channel in the United States which is doing something similar except that we want to help also produce the content by our uh, institutes. This is about the live and uh, scheduled streaming part then of course after something is broadcasted and you haven't been able to follow it you want to go back to the video archive and have it available by video on demand. So we also have to look in that, and that's our last goal. I'll wrap up. <clears throat> the title said something about developments going on in Europe and beyond. Well, the new task forces is what's going on in Europe and what we're working on. And be the things beyond, I just want to mention, are uh, the developments going on in uh, Internet2 and FIDENET. Uh, why? Well, because... This is now a global effort, and we're working closely together already. As the chair of TF Stream, I've been invited to take part in the different management teams and steering committees of the efforts going on in the U.S., and we have to do the same 
uh, here. Um, especially the work in setting up larger scale video conferencing, looking at dialing schemes, the use of directory to combine that, and set up the management tools uh, that network managers in organizations and research networks can use to maintain these services. That is being done by FIDENET. And the Internet 2 Commons started an international collaboration service called the Internet 2 Commons. Uh, although started by Internet 2, it really is an international service, and about 25% of the people joining the service now are international, like it's always been in FIDENIT, which is actually now up to 30-35% of international participants. Uh, it's not only 3 to 3, it's supporting multicast conferencing, it's combining access grid nodes, it's doing MPEG and providing the gateways between the different technologies, and also having their own VRVS reflectors to do the scheduling and providing these gateways. There's also work done in middleware. Although the, we described and, and, and researched the different technologies in this conference, you heard about more technologies. What we're really aiming at is setting up services that can be provided to either the national constituencies or within your own university if you want to set it up. And to make sure that your services, your video conferencing and video streaming services, which are different from web services, are really integrated in your campus infrastructure, we have to do a lot of work on the middleware issues. Especially, how do you do authentication and authorization? For web services, we now have a pretty good idea. But now, enter a video conferencing appliance into the mix. And how do you do it there? That's the middleware research that's done in the FITMIT working group, which is a FIDE Internet 2 uh, working group. And finally, in connection to uh, the work that is done here on the Voice over IP working group, Internet 2 also has a Voice over IP working group, which is, well, an Internet 2 working group, but also has participants from Asia, and especially RNET, which is the largest Voice over IP network. I mean, in Europe we have Chessnet, but in Australia, they're doing about 18 to 20,000 voice over IP calls a day on their network. They are a telecom operator. Um, so it's good to bring that expertise and actually that network to connect to uh, into the mix. So to conclude, we feel that TFStream is successful. Although not all deliverables have been uh, written as we thought it would be. Uh, not everything was very clear. It is especially a success in the way that participants learn from the different efforts and the deliverables that we uh, deliver. It's a very strong uh, uh, community that's still working together, although the task force ended, um, well, uh, officially a year ago. We're still working together. The TF3 mailing list is seen as one of the uh, the sources, if you want to know about video conferencing and video streaming in the higher education and research, we have several hundred subscribers from all over the world that are using uh, that. We have worldwide recognition of all the work that we've done and are invited. I'm traveling around and being able to talk uh, about all these things we're doing in Europe. And there are some follow-up actions um, that people still feel this is interesting. It's still Video conferencing and video streaming still is one of the interest, special interest areas uh, of Terena. So uh, we propose the formation of two new task force on voice and video over IP and academic netcasting. Thank you, Egan. Even if we are a bit more over time, I believe there are questions for you. Any question? Sabine. No. No, no, no. Uh, yes, this is a proposed deliverable for the uh, new to be formed task force on voice over IP. No, sorry, it's not ready. And uh, do I know any other? No, because the Internet 2 voice over IP working group is working on just such a cookbook. Uh, Chestnet doesn't have all documentation available in English. And INET, uh, well, doesn't ha really have public available material. So, as far as we know, there's no cookbook yet. That's why we put it in there. Any other question?
If not, I have one. Uh, I'm, I'm nearly sure that any of you which was wandering around the multicast session announcement protocol ended up in the Finnish parliament, so they understand what you mean about the Finnish archive. Wonderful looking people understand nothing what they say. There are around Europe, as you mentioned, a very large number of initiatives which create their own infrastructure, their own uh, insula of service. And of course, very often they need to talk to each other. But very often they don't know where to find the cross point, where to find the gateway, etc. Is this something which is also one of the aims of the continuation? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, that's all. That's. I mean, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, put that in clearly, but uh, one of the main aims of forming a task force is actually doing coordination, and and uh, not only dis uh, disseminate the results afterwards, but. Um, I'm, I'm one big reflector, and I feel that as my task, since I've been involved in video conferencing and video streaming in Europe now for the last four or five years, um, it's, it's important that there is some point you can go to if you want to know uh, who is what's doing, on? what's out there, what's available, who is doing what, to compare and to do that. And Terena, as an organization that, that coordinates work among the different national research networks, but also universities and institutes themselves, uh, as we have many people uh, uh, that, that come here at these conferences, and they can participate in the task forces. You don't have to be an NRN to participate in the task forces. And yes, our, one of our goals is exactly doing that coordination. Okay. Any other question? No. So thank you, Egon. <laughs> and pl please continue to do what you are doing because we need it. Our next speaker is Bert, if I remember by heart, yes. Bert, apart from being our chief administrator officer in, in Terena, is also the responsible guy for an activity which started very smoothly, very silently inside ourselves, just collecting the information and trying to put together uh, a little booklet where who is who was written down uh, while doing it, we discover that who is who was so interesting that uh, even the commission asked us to provide them a service about this cookbook, etc. And uh, also the other networks which appear in the cookbook find it very, very useful. So this activity grew quite a lot and now uh, it is going to become a permanent activity. How many minutes can you give me for my 312 slides? Uh, 20. 20? Oh. 15. 15, okay. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I will uh, first start by telling you something about the policy context in which this uh, uh, compendium thing is beginning to function. Then I will show you some of the new stuff that we have for the uh, draft uh, alpha, beta version of the 2002 edition of the compendium, and uh, then I'll tell you something about future developments and specifically the Combren uh, project. And I'll ask for your help, or at least the help of the NRNs uh, that are involved in the data gathering exercise. Um, the compendium, as Claudio already said, was actually first... Uh, discussed, uh, uh, the suggestion was first made at a, a General Assembly meeting in October 1999. We uh, tried it out and uh, based on the, on the experiences of the trial, uh, produced a, a real version in October last year that's available in print, at least for the analytical part, and also uh, on the web at the URL that you see there. Um, and uh, we found from our earlier experience that trial and error is the best way forward with this thing, and that's what we've done since. Uh, questionnaires for 2002 were distributed early this year, and uh, I've just completed uh, the trial version of the, uh, of the an analytical part. Uh, uh, it's called the limited edition, and a limited number of copies of that limited edition is available in this room. Uh, it's also on the web. But you should note that there are still some errors uh, in there that we hope to uh, get double-checked by the NRNs that gave the data uh, that will be taken up, uh, corrected in the, in the full edition. 
the questionnaire was developed and in fact a lot of the analysis and the thinking has also been developed with the aid of a review panel. You see the names here and those people actually deserve uh, quite a lot of the credit for the fact that I'm able to uh, give you this talk here. Uh, we received uh, answers um, uh, to our questions from the large majority of NRNs uh, in Europe actually as you can see on this map. This is actually a map um, that shows when NRNs were started. Uh, the last editions were Iceland, which changed uh, uh, to a new, um, a new NRN was set up there, and, and Armenia. Um, as you see, we also have some replies from countries uh, in the Mediterranean region, uh, but those, in fact, uh, were, were given to us uh, by an early, as the results of an earlier survey that was carried out within the framework of the UMED Connect project. Um, the 2001 edition has been used, as we found out, by several NRNs to help convince their funding bodies and their government that more funding or a better policy environment or whatever um, was needed. So um, we were very pleased to see, let's say, the, the, the take-up of that sense, in that sense. It was also a basis um, for a data collection and thinking within the framework of a, a, a EU project called the CBIS project that aims to develop statistical indicators, indicators for benchmarking the information society. And um, that's a bit of jargon that I'll come back to later on in my talk. And uh, it was used as a basis for um, uh, benchmark indicator data for the E-Europe Action Plan. Uh, internally, we uh, see the role of the compendium uh, uh, as such that in in such a way that there is, let's say, the Géant project and also, in general, the development of the NRNs, the surface provision that's done by, by, by Dante. Here you see the train. Um, then there is, let's go back, there is preparing for the future, for the train to continue to move forward. We need forward-looking projects, uh, forward-looking studies, and the Serenata project uh, uh, is planning to do this debt, and David will talk about that in a moment. And we need a monitoring of the, the progress of the NRN development, not just of the traffic on the NRNs, but of the, the NRNs themselves. And that's being done in the framework of, uh, of the compendium activities. So, what is the progress then? I want to take you back to 1999, as Egon just did as well, to the Terrain and Ordernet conference. And the, challenge of, uh, the, the motto of that conference was the challenge of gigabit networking. At that time, gigabit networking was not yet here. Um, but now it has arrived, as you will see, as you know, by the way. Um, there are ideas of what to do with the, all these gigabits, and therefore the motto of this conference, there's a straight line from 1999 to 2002, is networks for collaboration. And if you see uh, the, the graph, uh, everybody knows this, I think, but I think it's nice to show it anyway. Uh, this was the capacity of the highest links of NRNs in June of last year. Uh, many NRNs were at... 155, 322 uh, uh, megabits. A few, Germany and the Netherlands, uh, had uh, 622 megabits. And the situation in January was, as you see here, most NRNs being in the 2.5 gigabit uh, range, at least the NRNs that are on the core of, of Jean. Albania, you can't even see... Uh, uh, the capacity of their link on this graph because it's 512 kilobits, if I remember correctly. Um, was there also a quantum leap in the budget of NRNs? Uh, no, there wasn't. It's been possible to achieve this, this large leap in uh, external connectivity without a real, a real leap in NRN budgets. And this shows... Uh, uh, the development in the budgets for some of the smaller NRNs. I'll go through this fairly quickly because you can all uh, double-check it on the web or in the limited edition that's available here. Now, of course, we have evolved to gigabit networking at the international level through the Jean project. What happened at the national level? 
Uh, one of the uh, things that we have looked at is core network speeds. Um, the speed on the backbone. Now, of course, many, some NRNs have a star topology, so they don't have a, a backbone in that sense. Uh, but we've asked for the capacity of the highest link in that case. Um, this is a log scale, by the way. Uh, so it goes from, um, from one megabit, less than one megabit for Albania. That's that uh, 512 kilobit to it last year, uh, two and a half megabits uh, for the most advanced uh, NRNs, uh, two and a half gigabits, sorry. Let's keep the, the units strictly separated here. Um, and this is the situation uh, now. As you see, some of the more, uh, only a few NRNs have advanced to 10 gigabit uh, levels. Most of the others have stayed the same. And uh, if you look at the um, access capacities for large sites on the network, I must admit a fairly ambig ambiguous term, but um, then this is what we have for a number of countries so for 2001. Uh, as you see, in 2001, only the Netherlands and the Czech Republic were offering one gigabit access um, to large sites. Um, now, uh, you, as you can see, there's no drastic difference in 2002 in the situation. And um, even though Luxembourg has, has moved from two megabits to one gigabit, uh, that's actually also the jump that uh, SurfNet people uh, advised to, the, to us in the Terena Secretariat when we wanted to upgrade our link. They said, why go to four? It's cheaper to go to a gigabit. Um, but um, I think a lot is going to happen in the next couple of years because we've asked NRNs what they think it will be in two years' time. And uh, that's, that's when you get these uh, statistics. NRNs are clearly planning to move to one gigabit um, and beyond, and in the case of, um, of some of the most advanced networks, such as uh, the Netherlands, they're planning to go far above the two and a half uh, gigabits, but putting that in a graph uh, would not improve legibility. Of course, uh, as was clear last year, the gap between the most advanced NRNs and the NRNs uh, in some of the uh, let's say, poorer countries, or maybe I should even say some of the non-géant countries, is, is getting wider and wider. Um, Croatia is actually in here, but I think the data for Croatia need to be, uh, need to be corrected. But as you see, uh, uh, some of these NRNs uh, are still uh, at the 2, 4 megabit uh, level, and uh, they don't seem to see the means of developing uh, uh, into a higher range. Some of the others, uh, especially the ones that are part of the, of the Jean project, obviously do see opportunities to move uh, far beyond where they are now. Okay, now uh, some of the new things that we have asked in the compendium. Uh, one of the statistics that we have tried as, uh, for the first time is to get information about traffic load, um, incoming traffic load. As you see, and as what we expected, of course, with, uh, with the new Géant infrastructure, many of the NRNs in January had traffic loads with the new infrastructure of below uh, 10%. And uh, uh, the 70% uh, traffic load is for, for Yugoslavia, which is obviously not on... Um, on Géant or anything like it. Uh, what I don't trust is the figure for Germany in here. <laughs> I think we have to do some fine-tuning there still. Um, and you want to know, of course, whether you are importers or exporters of data, so we also asked for the outgoing traffic load. Um, this is also a graph that I think must be interesting, even though I don't quite know what it means. We asked NRNs uh, which percentage of their budget is spent on data communications. And as you can see, it, uh, it ranges from, let's say, between 25, 30% to 90% in, uh, in countries like Austria, Italy, uh, Slovakia, uh, Spain. Um, now, 
nobody should think that spending less is better or spending more is worse or whatever uh, because uh, the ways NRNs are structured are very different. The ways NRNs employ staff and, and, uh, and account for that are, are very different and also the services that NRNs offer uh, are different. And of course that has a big effect on, on, uh, on this kind of, uh, of figure. Uh, but it does lead me to think that there's probably scope for NRN collaboration in trying to bring uh, data communications costs down. Um, yeah, this is um, uh, a graph that, should, uh, that partly helps to explain the last one because it shows the staff sizes uh, of the various NRNs. And again, it should be seen in connection with an idea of what services the NRNs actually deliver. Uh, some NRNs, uh, like the Luxembourg NRN, provide connectivity to all the primary schools in the country. And of course that needs more staff and a different kind of staff uh, than if you only provide services to the, to the universities. Now, uh, let me go to, um, to the future a little bit. Uh, one of the nice things about the compendium was that it contained so many graphs that you could actually always find a graph that would suit you as an NRN, present that to your policymaker and that one only, and, and, and um, get what you want out of it. Um, um, and uh, I have recycled a slide from my presentation of, uh, of last year, uh, where, which I called Europe's, which is Europe's prettiest NRN, and where I presented a number of these, uh, these slides illustrating the wonderful possibilities for fooling uh, your policymakers with statistics uh, that we had. Now, I don't think that uh, it should stay that way, even though some of it is obviously uh, useful. Um, under the Comran project, which we hope will receive uh, funding from the Commission uh, soon, uh, uh, we will be able to publish uh, the compendium in a nice format uh, this year, at the end of this year and, and next year. And we are also probably going to, to generate uh, sets of benchmarking uh, data. And I want to, do I still have time? Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about that benchmarking uh, because uh, I don't know what it means. Do you know what it means? Um, I've come to the conclusion that it's actually one of these new buzzwords that in theory, if you look it up, has a precise meaning, but in practice, benchmarking indicators, benchmarking data can mean almost anything. Um, and therefore, there is an opportunity uh, for us in our dialogue with the Commission, uh, for the NRNs in dialogue with the Commission, to uh, help develop this concept and to uh, uh, help develop indicators that we understand and that actually mean something. Um, in the E-Europe Action Plan, uh, the benchmark indicator for faster internet for researchers and students, that's the NRNs of course, was the speed of the interconnections, uh, as written here. But uh, the E-Europe Action Plan is ending. Uh, there's no certainty, I think, yet about uh, what is going to be in the next E-Europe Action Plan, even if it I don't think it's even certain if, there is going to, if it's going to be called E-Europe, whatever. Um, so uh, there is a chance, perhaps, that benchmarking will disappear again and that we don't need to bother about it anymore. However, I don't think so. Um, I think that the EU is going to is set to play uh, an important role in the future as well uh, as today in the development of research networking. I also think that Europe will be held accountable for what it does with all its funds and uh, that it will be held accountable uh, increasingly. So uh, it will ask those who receive European funds um, to show what they've achieved with that. And I think uh, at the national level, the era where uh, civil servants uh, uh, didn't know the distinction between a typewriter and a computer is also ending uh, very quickly. So at the national level, policymakers will also ask you, show me what you've done with your money, show me how well you've done in, in relation to other networks as well. Uh, 
Therefore, we have to work together, I think, NRNs have to work together to try to shape this debate uh, in a way that is meaningful uh, and useful uh, for the uh, research networking community. We need to ask better questions uh, for the future. Uh, we've tried to do that in, uh, in 2002, and I have a little something that illustrates that. Uh, uh, one of the indicators we, we developed, and we're still not sure if it means anything, was the traffic per student per year. Um, These uh, are some figures. Forget them immediately because they don't really mean very much. Um, for 2001, for a number of countries. And uh, this is, these are the figures from 2002, and as you can see, they're very different. And why are they different? Are they be different because of the rapid evolution in research networking? Uh, no, they are different because we ask the question slightly differently. In fact, we ask the question in a, in a better way. We think we got better data. Uh, but it means that uh, the results are no longer uh, comparable. Um, so we hope to improve that in future, generate better data and generate more comparable data and, and generate uh, data um, that we understand better um, and therefore ask better questions. We also need to ask fewer questions. Um, the load on the networks uh, in by sending them this questionnaire was considerable. Um, but it's a necessary phase. We first need to go broad and, and ask all kinds of things and then uh, by trial and error find out what is actually uh, the most relevant, uh, what are the best questions for understanding the NRNs better. And in fact, uh, for understanding the NRNs better, we may need to delve a little bit more deeply into certain aspects of how NRNs function, what services they deliver, etc. And under the Comran project, there's going to be a little bit of funding to try this out by, by uh, carrying out what we have called uh, focus studies, or at least one focus study, into one aspect uh, of NRN work. Now, uh, we are not afraid of criticisms. Um, we are going to have another review panel and uh, we need people for that. We need to know better what we really want to know in order to be able to ask fewer questions. And we need to think about uh, what further studies are most relevant uh, to undertake. And of course, a tip for the NRN people here, uh, please check and update your data and fill out the questionnaire. Um, the next questionnaire is going to arrive sooner than, uh, than in January, and that's because uh, last year we actually were forced to send out uh, two questionnaires briefly after one another, one for the EU benchmarking exercise and one for ourselves. And uh, for next year we want to integrate uh, those two, but it means that we may have to uh, be a bit faster than we were uh, last year. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. We... we are very late in the session, partly because this is a late room. Apparently, statistics say that this is a room where we run late every time. Partly because of Continental Line, partly because of me, which arrived five minutes late. So, one question only, if any. Roberto. Everything, all, all the external traffic that goes out of the, uh, the NRN network proper. Okay, thank you again, Bert. Now, David Williams, which apart from being Torino's president, is uh, also has been involved in the IT technology at CERN in Geneva since a large number of years. So you will find his name in a number of papers ranging from computing structure, computer organization, networking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now as Torino president has got the policy role as well. So Serenat is going to explain us what the community is going to to prepare for the Commission has a strategic plan for the next year. David. 
Thank you, Claudia. Um, uh, I want my coffee as much as you do, and yes. I'm surely interested to hear um, both Tony Hay and uh, Ian Foster, so I will go as fast as I can. Uh, I'll try and tell you what Serenade is about, uh, what are the strategic questions it will study, uh, its timescales, and indeed how you can participate. Uh, the acronym is a study into European research and education networking as targeted by eEurope. It is funded as an, a European Commission project in FB5 with the objective of looking at our, the uh, NREN community's needs on the time scale of roughly five years ahead. Uh, f five to ten, but you know, we, most of us don't believe we can uh, make uh, good analysis 10 years down the road. It is not about making detailed plans for any specific networks. Who's involved in it? Uh, Dorena is the coordinating part partner. Uh, Dante is uh, in there because, as you'll see, there's a lot of uh, technical and economic work uh, in that area. It's helped by the Center for Teleinformatics, the Technical University of Denmark, where they have a group specialized in uh, the economics of telecoms systems. And end users are represented by two partners, the Academia Europea, which is a, dis as an academy of distinguished researchers, 2,000 of them, and the European Science Foundation, which is where many of Europe's uh, academies and uh, research councils get together. We also, and that's one of the reasons for having this talk here, are hoping very much that the NRENs represented in the room and hopefully other actors, and I'll indicate some of those, uh, will participate in this work. There's one a strategic assumption which is made in Serenata. I mean, it's supposed to be free-ranging, but uh, one basic model that I think helps us keep our thinking clear uh, the three-level the three level architecture, we have, in order to provide uh, networking for our researchers, we have to make sure that it's available on campus. We have to make sure that there is a good national infrastructure, and that may, of course, in some areas of Europe, involve either regional infrastructures, a la Nordunet, or metropolitan infrastructures, as you see in several countries. And at the third level, you have the European Interconnect uh, GEO. And our, our basic strategic assumption is that you will not escape from the need to tackle the problem at those three levels. There is indeed, as somebody correctly pointed out in Brussels two weeks ago, in fact, a fourth layer, uh, which I think doesn't really concern Serenata, which is how does how do we obtain our intercontinental connectivity? So let's spend a few minutes uh, discussing some of the strategic questions that we sometimes hear people asking us. Um, what should be the nature of NRENs? How much technical expertise do they need? Bert has shown you that they, they have very different approaches sometimes. Uh, how much direct responsibility do they have and should they maintain for their operation? More crudely, and it's a question which is sometimes posed, I know, to some of our members, especially those in less developed or less economically strong areas of Europe, why can't the commercial ISPs do everything for the academic and research community? I mean, I think there are very clear answers to that question, but it's something we do sometimes get asked. Uh, it's now clear that the whole uh, of our uh, community is moving from a best efforts IP to a multi-service version of networking. Uh, that has the consequence that all of these services need end-to-end -end organization across multiple boundaries and the reliability of that is a non-trivial problem, how you monitor it, how you fix it. There are, I mean that's the point about the three-layer architecture, it's very hard to balance the need for you know, the university to fix, to decide how it does its own thing with the researcher's need for good end-to-end -end performance when she is connecting to America. 
from the technical advisory group uh, discussion uh, on Monday, uh, one of the things that came out was that NRENs are going to be forced to move into an area or, or to consider how they handle in their country the area of broader infrastructure, authorization, uh, authentication, and accounting is, is a very obvious one. Uh, and the point is that's an interaction between the universities, the NRENs themselves, their national university system, and international user communities such as GRIDS. Um, some more strategic questions. Are our present economic assumptions likely to evolve smoothly or be disrupted? Uh, we all know that optical fiber is giving us the potential for much more bandwidth, but you've seen in the last few months the turbulence, chaos, I would rather say, in the bandwidth market, and we need to think about how that's likely to evolve. There are, and there have been presentations at this meeting, uh, examples of NRENs moving to own or long-term lease their own fiber infrastructures. This is a good idea. Uh, as far as I personally know, in Europe, we have at least the Czech Republic, Poland, and Switzerland having that as a uh, rather specifically declared goal, and there may be others. Um, the NRENs have traditionally worked with tertiary education, universities, and higher, edu uh, higher education institutes. Um, and in some countries, people ask to what extent they should be involved in primary and secondary education. Uh, that's a strategic issue for us all. Uh, solution may not be, almost certainly will not be the same in all countries in, of Europe. Uh, and there's a related point, which is uh, because you're dealing with students, then the access to student lodging and where they are at the weekend becomes uh, an important issue as well, which leads you into issues of making sure that you have good inter interconnection to your commercial ISPs. Strategic question, what about access to libraries and healthcare slash hospitals where there are probably different, you know, those are different aspects of, of, of our healthcare systems. Hospitals have strong research components. Healthcare is broader and has different sets of requirements. But what about moving into what about access? Uh, should the NRENs be involved in, in those areas? Uh, some more political questions. Uh, how do we handle the networking needs of the Sixth Framework Program, the European Research Area? The Parliament had a report uh, prepared by Malcolm Harbour. Are we addressing uh, what they require? What about the E-Europe Action Plan? There's some specific requests made in that on, uh, on NREN evolution. And in general, we should be pro proposing ambitious goals uh, as, as part of that evolution, as far as I understand it. What's the, what about the geography? What is the proper geographical extent of Europe that we as a community should be feeling concerned by? And inside uh, whatever we define as Europe, what about the equality of opportunity for researchers uh, across the different countries? Uh, there are very different pricing in uh, some countries where there's non-competitive telecom situation and how should that be coped with? So we're not short of strategic questions. Uh, I'll indicate a couple where I think they're out of scope. Uh, we can't try and tackle everything. It's, uh, it's it's a significant project, but it's not huge. Uh, I think that the issue of connectivity to neighboring countries, and I gave a list of, give a list of them there, is very important. I feel uh, sort of uh, concerned by this, and in my CERN, some aspects of my CERN job, I'm very concerned by it. But actually trying to get to grips with this in a, in a really significant way is beyond the scope of Serenata, in my opinion. Uh, I think that the issues of proper intercontinental connectivity are being handled effectively in the Géon context and won't need uh, significant attention in, in Serenata. Maybe some re-emphasis of the point about end-to-end -end issues. Timescales, it's an EU project. Uh, 
It finally was signed on the uh, 30th of April, uh, and we got to know about it a few days later. It runs from the 1st of May for 15 months, so until end of July next year. Uh, there are 14 work areas structured mainly into workshops, studies, and report writing. The workshops. The, there will be an initial workshop. Uh, there's another foil with some more details. Uh, in mid-September in La Ulp, we'd actually hoped originally to put it back-to-back -back with the, uh, the Géant Launch event and uh, Global Research Networking Summit in, in in Brussels two weeks ago, but that didn't turn out to be possible because of the uh, starting date of the contract. There'll be a workshop where the operators can make their views on infrastructure status and evolution clear. Uh, one sort of intermediate one where we discuss possible models for the future. Uh, the user community will try and get their end user requirements and priorities specified in a workshop in Montpellier. And a final one, uh, May, June, because we'll have to be careful not to clash it too badly with next year's Terrain Conference. Uh, the initial workshop will be in La Ulp, which is an IBM uh, education center, sort of about 10 or 15 kilometers out of Brussels. Uh, it'll be by invitation uh, with a maximum audience of 150 people, so it'll be only a few people per country. Uh, mix of NREN staff, people funding the NRENs, people responsible for the campuses, real end users, some suppliers. We want to try and make it interactive and to discuss and define the scope of the project and how we should tackle these strategic issues. There will be five breakout groups, one on technical evolution, one on economics, one on how to handle these issues of the other user communities one on the geographical things, and one on pure end-user needs. And from the web page, I'll give you the address in a minute, you can get some more details of that. We have some funding for each workshop as part of the project, but in general, attendees will have to cover their own travel and accommodation costs. We do have some funding to support some participants who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. So if you think you come in that category, then there will be instructions on in the invitation on how to uh, try and apply for that. There'll be reports produced from each of the workshops, uh, and in addition, there'll be, uh, there are a set of uh, reports contracted on areas like trends in the transport and infrastructure market, which is obviously where uh, Dante has a lot of expertise, the regulatory situation where they have as well, but CTI is, is uh, also well informed. Equipment trends, where we hope the whole community will be involved. Uh, telecoms market and, um, well, okay, you read the rest. We're getting, we're wanting our coffee. Um, I've basically said that. How can you participate? So for the NRENs in the room, this is your project. Please participate actively. Give your input, uh, make sure that your people coming to the uh, initial workshop uh, representing you well. Your experts, you will have information about the regulatory situation in your country, so please make sure we capture that. Your technical staff uh, into the group on evolution of equipment. And right. Many of these bullets are also directly applicable to ENPG members and potentially to uh, people in other uh, network-oriented bodies, uh, thinking of things like JISC in the UK. Um, network, and if, if, if you're in the business of providing network or infrastructure, uh, we'd be very interested to hear your views, and we hope to see you in the operators workshop. Similar remark applies to the equipment vendors. Here's the steering committee, uh, which I'm chairing. Marco Bonac uh, from Arnes will uh, concentrate on the area of the geographical issues. Uh, Ian Butterworth and uh, Tony Meyer, a bit lower down, are uh, end user representatives. Di Davis, you all know, Sabine Jom is chairing the 
education and other users uh, part of it. Uh, Fernando Liello is also with us and Knuderic Scobie, Scobie is, from, uh, is dealing with much of the economics. And Carol Feach is there too. There's the address. Uh, there is information on the website. Um, Valentino Cavalli is also working with us, and uh, I think when the panic of this, uh, not panic, when the hard work of this conference is over, he will be helping to expand that. That's it. Thank you, David, for being very quick, but also very exhaustive in the presentation. Questions? Egon. Um, uh, that, that quite, I mean, actually sort of hearing Bert's talk made me think that we probably need to repeat that talk in the initial workshop. Um, no, I think there's actually some good, there, there's some good food for thought for people in the initial workshop in there. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 we'll think about the question. I, there, there may be, an, you know, people certainly don't like multiple, uh, multiple questionnaires. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, David, I, yeah. I'd like to ask about technology transfer and innovation. The context is that in Ireland here, there's been a radical improvement in the uh, amount of money invested in basic research. But coming with that, there's an increasing government concern with the technology transfer, turning this investment Okay, let's try a couple of uh, different bits of answer to that. Um, the, the, I think bullet point one of the strategic question is actually, you know, sometimes we need to go down and say, right, why do we need uh, NRANs and what are their roles and I personally believe that one of the roles of NRANs and indeed one of the roles of all uh, basic science uh, institutions which can be universities or research centers is to be significantly more involved in this field than in the past. Um, you know, I, I have a very personal um, view on we invented the World Wide Web in CERN and it was a success and probably part of the fact that it was a success was that it was put into the public domain. Um, if we'd come back to it ten years later we might have done some of that differently including putting it into the public domain with, with some more uh, requirement for recognition. It's, a com it's quite a complicated area, as you very well know. <laughs> but uh, it's part of terrain. I mean, I regard this as part of Terena's mission. Uh, I, I think all Enrans have to see that as part of their mission. And uh, I think, you know, the strategic reply to that first bullet should include some of that. I think we all want to go for coffee. Yes, exactly. Yeah? Okay. So I wish to thank David. Thank you for patience and coffee.